Jake Donham, and um, I'm going to tell you about the project that I work on on Twitter, uh, which is called Stitch, and it's a library for service composition. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the problem that I'm trying to solve with Stitch, and um, give you an overview of how it works, and then show you a couple of kind of grab bag of uh, interesting examples of um, things you can do with Stitch. Okay, so. Um, this is kind of a graphical overview of the uh, service-oriented architecture that we have at Twitter. Um, <laughs> it's it's kind of crazy. It, it sometimes does feel a lot like this, just uh, services on top of services. Um, so, you know, as, as in any service-oriented architecture, uh, the Twitter application is built on top of dozens and dozens of services, and they call each other in this hierarchy. And so uh, Jeff was telling us about you know, how Zipkin lets you drill down through that whole hierarchy. Uh, but this sort of new problem arises of how do you actually program to this collection of services and how do you uh, write a, an application effectively. So um, uh, communication happens over Thrift and sort of a distinguished feature of these Thrift APIs is that there's a lot of batch APIs. So we have this need to amortize the costs of doing RPC in the system. And so a really typical uh, RPC call is something like this where you want to get the tweet object for a bunch of tweet IDs and you pass it a sequence of IDs and you get back a sequence of tweets. Um, so that will turn out to have implications about how we, how we write our applications. Um, okay, so to do a good job of programming to, to this constellation of services, uh, we want to take advantage of concurrency. So we want to be able to fire off requests which don't have any data dependencies between them and have them be executed concurrently. Um, we want to take advantage of these batch APIs, and we want the code with that we write to be sort of good code. It should be clear and modular, easy to understand. Um, but it turns out that these things are somewhat in conflict. So, um, so I think most people here are familiar with futures. I just want to make sure that people have a, at least a rough idea of what I'm talking about with futures, because uh, Stitch is very closely related to futures. So. Um, so a future of some type t is a future result of that type t. So it's, it's a value which may not be ready yet, right? So you can't use it directly, but you can sort of um, consume it with map or flat map, and you can chain these things together. You can sort of think of a future as like a little thread that's running. Um, so this is a really nice way to talk about concurrency. Um, it's sort of typeful in the sense that the type t inside the future is sort of an abstraction of, of what the value is. We don't really know who the producer of the future is. We're just getting back some value of type T. Um, and it's got this really nice way to express concurrency. We can just fire off a bunch of these things, and then when we actually care uh, to see these different threads at once, we can join them together or something like that. All right, uh, so this is a batch of croissants, so I want to talk about the problems of batching. Um, I made croissants with my son last weekend. It was just super easy and super fun, so I really recommend it. They're delicious. Um, anyway, so it turns out that uh, the need to have these batch APIs kind of screws up your application. And, and let me try to um, illustrate this a little bit. So this is sort of an example of the kind of thing that Twitter application code is full of. So you you have some tweet IDs and you want to get the tweet object and then that tweet object contains a user so you want to get the user object and then you want to do something with it. So this is an extremely stripped down example but I'm trying to give you a flavor of, of how this goes. And so what I've done here is written this in kind of direct style. So um, we're just assuming that get tweet and get user are like synchronous calls and we can just make them directly and wait for their result and get them back. So we'd kind of like to be able to write this sort of code. This like clearly expresses what it is that we're doing. For each of these tweet IDs, we're getting a tweet and then getting a user. Um, but uh, this is the code that we tend to write um, at Twitter to take advantage of batch interfaces. So um, these two calls here, get tweet batch and get user batch, uh, take a sequence of IDs and return a sequence of objects. And these are all returning futures because all of, the, all of our RPC calls return futures. So, um, so what we do here is we get some tweets, we flat map that so the, uh, the tweets value there is the actual list of tweets. We extract a list of user IDs and pass that to the get user batch. Um, and now we have this problem that we kind of need to match up the users that we got back with the tweets which requested them. And so we put these things into a map and then we traverse the tweets again and sort of find the user that corresponded to the user ID for that tweet. Um, 
And this is kind of pervasive. Like we find this stuff all over the place in our applications. And sometimes the entire structure of the application is kind of organized to support this sort of batch access. It's really a pain. The point of Stitch is to make it possible to write code that looks very similar to what I showed on the first slide, but actually get the batching under the hood. So, um, so what we're doing here is we have this, uh, this method stitch.traverse, which um, maps a function over a list and then sort of waits for all the results to come back asynchronously. Um, so if you've used futures, there's future.collect. Uh, traverse is a combination of map and collect, basically. Um, so so we're, I'm using a for expression here um, because this is all happening with map and flat map, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but for each of these tweets, we are making a single get tweet call to get back the tweet and then the get user call to get back the user. And so the effect is the same as before. The execution model actually will batch all of the get tweet calls into a single batch call to the, the service and the same with the get user calls. So we get the same execution pattern, um, but the code is a lot simpler and easier to understand. So that is kind of the basic idea of Stitch and um, everything else that I'll talk about uh, is supporting that. Um, uh, I couldn't find anything good for the word Stitch, but I like this woven pie thing. So um, anyway, um, so, <laughs> um, so here's the Stitch interface. And if you've looked at futures, either the, um, the Twitter future or the Scala future, uh, API, oops, I screwed up my formatting. Um, it looks really similar. Um, so if you're into monads and all that kind of thing, this, this is a monad. And uh, so we have this, um, actually, sorry, I haven't showed the, the monad part of it, but this is sort of the companion object. We have a way to construct a stitch from a concrete value. Uh, we have a way to join two stitches together to get um, a stitch of the pair. So here we're basically saying that these are two asynchronous things happening and we want to wait for both of them and um, get the pair of their result. Sort of a generalization of that is collect where we have a whole sequence of stitches and we want to get back a stitch of the sequence. So we're going to wait for all of the elements uh, in the sequence and then return all of their values. And here's the traverse thing that I was talking about before, which is really exactly like just mapping a function over the sequence and then calling collect on the result. Um, it just happens to be convenient a lot. Okay, so these are sort of ways to construct stitches. Um, and then, how do you actually do something with a stitch? Um, we have this method stitch.run, which takes a stitch expression and returns a future, and you can sort of interoperate with any future code that you have. So basically, everything that happens in the Twitter service stack deals in futures, and so uh, this is how we hook into that world. Um, now, uh, I will talk a little bit later about what the actual execution model is because it's quite a bit different from futures. Um, and here's the other part of uh, the Stitch API. This is what the Stitch trait looks like, and it's got all the standard stuff, uh, map and flat map, and then these exception handling methods. Um, I don't know if these are on the Scala feature. I haven't, I haven't looked uh, too closely at that, but the, the Twitter feature has this stuff. Um, okay, uh, any questions about that so far? Okay. Um, okay, so then the other thing we have, um, I've showed you sort of the abstract API, now we sort of need to connect uh, stitch queries to the services um, that you want to call. And the basic thing we're trying to do here is figure out what kinds of calls can be batched together. So um, the batch APIs that we have at Twitter are really heterogeneous. There's, there are some which sort of take arbitrary requests to arbitrary responses. There's some which take like a, a sequence of IDs and then some kind of contextual information that talks about how do you interpret those IDs. There's all these different ways to do it. And so what we have are these service adapters that make it possible to express how do you call the underlying service. So, so what I'm trying to explain here, and let me, let me actually start at the bottom. Um, we want a method which takes a single tweet ID and returns a single tweet in the Stitch monad. Um, and so what we're going to do is, is create a Stitch call, which just sort of represents the RPC call. And it's going to have a group. And, and the group is going to indicate what calls can be batched together. So every call with the same group can be stuck into a single batch. And assuming that we've accumulated a batch of these things, we need to know how to actually execute the RPC call. And that's in the implementation of this, this group. Oh, whoops, I, uh, I misnamed these. But um, so we've accumulated a list of tweet IDs here, and then we're going to call this batch method that I was talking about before. 
So this is basically this much is really all you have to implement to adapt Stitch to a new service. And again, some of the services have more complicated interfaces, so there might be a little more complication there, but um, it's a pretty thin, pretty thin layer. Um, okay, so let me talk a little bit about the execution model for these things. So um, a Stitch uh, query, I usually call it, um, is just a syntax tree. And when we want to execute this thing, we have to find all of the RPC calls in it. So um, basically, you can think of it as every map or flat map or anything that you do with the stitch turns into a new node in the syntax tree. And when we're ready to execute it, we just sort of explore this whole tree and look for all these call objects. Um, we group these things all together, and then we call the batch RPC methods for each one. And every time one of these RPCs returns, we can kind of simplify the query so we can fill in the new data that we've gotten and then sort of make simplifications, right? So if, I've, uh, if I have a map and I've gotten a concrete value back from the RPC, then I can actually execute that map or something like that. Um, and when we're exploring this query, we can see into a lot of the different methods um, where sort of concurrency is exposed. So if I have a join of two things, I can look down both branches to find more calls. Um, and that's true of most things except for flat map where we don't know what the flat map is going to do until we get the value back that it depends on, and so we can't see any further into the query. So that's sort of a place where we just have to stop analyzing the query. Um, OK. So some chocolates. Um, I just uh, I want to tell you a couple of different things that you can do with Stitch, um, hopefully to illustrate uh, what it's good for. So, so one of the things that, you know, of course, comes up in a distributed system is that you have this need for retries. And very often you want to, so if you have a batch interface, you're, you've got a bunch of keys that you've sent to it, and some of them may have failed and some of them may have succeeded. And you, uh, you really only want to retry the ones that have failed, and so you get back into this, this sort of manual batch management problem where you have to sort of go through and figure out which keys should go into the next query. Um, it turns out that if you write this in the Stitch style, um, doing these retries per key sort of turns into the batch query that you would like to do. So, so what I'm saying here is that we have this underlying um, perform method that takes some request type, returns some response. And what we want to do is uh, perform with some number of retries. And so what we'll do here is say, OK, call the underlying perform. If that fails and it's a retriable exception and we have more tries, we'll just go around the loop again um, with one fewer try. And if none of those things are true, we'll just let the exception bubble up. So I'm doing this for a single request, but my underlying interface may be a batch interface. Um, when I traverse a bunch of requests, what will happen in execution time is that we'll try all the requests the first time, and then the ones that failed, only the ones that failed will get sent in the second batch, and then only the ones of those that have failed get sent in the batch after that. And so this is something that you would have to write manually. It's kind of a pain, and it just sort of falls out of, of using Stitch for this. So that's kind of cute. Um, so this is uh, something totally different. Um, I, people are probably somewhat familiar with Mustache. It's like a, a templating system where you have these different tags that um, do iteration and conditionals and things like that. Um, and normally, the way you have to set this up is you have to um, do all of your RPC calls up front and then build this dictionary of names to values. And then that dictionary is consulted when you're filling this thing in. Um, and it can be a little bit painful because depending on what you're doing, you may find that a lot of sort of conditional logic gets duplicated both in your controller and your template where you're, you're trying to you, you may only make an RPC call under certain conditions, and so that condition has to appear in, in more than one place. So for one system at Twitter, uh, what we did is, is build a simple uh, compiler from mustache templates into stitch expressions so that all the asynchrony, you could sort of, each of these, these values here could be a stitch expression, and um, that would all, uh, all the asynchrony would happen at runtime, so you wouldn't have to duplicate that code. So that's, that's kind of a nice way to do that. Um, OK, this is a totally different sort of example where the underlying service is, isn't a thrift RPC service, but it's actually something like MySQL. And this need for batching actually comes, comes out really severely here. 
Um, if you use any like object relational mapping systems, um, there often comes up this problem that, that you, you want to avoid executing a single SQL query for each of the IDs in a list, right? And so there's various ways around this in, in different systems. Um, but it actually turns out to be really convenient to use Stitch uh, as a simple layer on top of SQL where you can, again, do single key queries, but have them turned into um, a batch query at the SQL level. So, um, okay, I just wanted to mention Haxel. I don't know, if, are people familiar with this at all? This is a Facebook project that was open source recently. So I just wanna talk a little bit about that. Uh, it's a Haskell project. Uh, Stitch is kind of a clean room re-implementation of it in a sense, in that uh, most of the ideas in Stitch come from an early talk about Haxel. Um, but Haxel had not yet been open sourced when I started working on Stitch, so it doesn't actually take advantage of any of the, uh, the Haxel code. Um, an interesting thing about Haxel is that it's sort of focused on a single project within Facebook. Um, because it's Haskell and much of Facebook is, is written in PHP, um, there's no easy way to bring those things together. Um, at Twitter, we have this fairly homogeneous environment in that almost everything runs on the JVM. And so we're able to use Stitch across a lot of different projects um, at Twitter. Um, Haxel is open source. Stitch is not yet open source, um, but I hope that it will be soon. Um, Okay, and that's what I have. Any questions? Uh, the question was, um, how is Stitch configurable for things like batch sizes? Um, there is support for that in particular. There's sort of a, you can limit the batch size. Um, there's kind of a broader question of like, how do you tune how the RPCs happen? It's not something that we've explored very much just because we haven't come into a situation where it was really necessary to have that fine, fine grain control, but it's sort of a trade off you get compared to using features directly. Like if you really need to tune exactly how your RPCs are made, um, Stitch doesn't really give you any knobs to do that at the moment. Um, and there's lots of different strategies you could use for deciding when to make calls. So the way it works now is like we collect up all the available calls and then issue them all at once. Um, and as soon as something comes back, we reevaluate, collect all the available calls and do it again. But you can imagine doing something like accumulating calls until you hit some threshold and then making a batch call or something like that. But we're not doing any of that right now. Um, the question was, uh, do we make any attempt to deduplicate um, the same key being requested uh, at different parts in the, of the, the query? Um, yes, we do. Um, there's a little subtlety there, which is that that happens every phase of the computation. So every time we go through and collect up all the available calls to, to put, execute them in batches, at that point we do deduplication. But if you have the same key called at two different points, at two different phases, um, those will not be deduped. And this is actually a difference with um, the Haxel project. So they, they have a caching layer where they actually cache all of the, um, the calls that are made in the course of running a whole query. And so they do get this kind of deduplication. Um, and they take that in some interesting directions where they, they use it for replay, so you can, um, you can collect up the call pattern and you know, store all that stuff and use it to replay entire queries. So the question was, um, uh, how do we handle failures? How does exception handling work? And I, I think what you're asking is, how, how does that work when you have a batch request? Okay, so the failures can happen at different levels, right? So there, there can be just a pure RPC failure where the machine you've called crashes or, or something like that happens. In that case, all of the sub-requests, all the keys in that batch request have to be failed. Um, there's also application level failures that can happen and many of our batch APIs expose per key failure. So a typical pattern in our batch APIs is like there's a request type and then a response type that embeds a failure code per key and we can decode those and independently fail the different parts of the stitch request. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you.